Greetings, folks. We are back on Lessons from the Cockpit Show. I'm your host, Marcus Serra. For 60 years, my passion has been aviation. I love airplanes. And ever since I was five years old, I've studied aviation, the tactics, but more importantly, the lessons learned and how they apply to events in our daily life. We want to expand your critical thinking skills and expertise by looking at aviation history in the air and on the ground by digging deeper into events. And it really helps when an opponent writes a book about all of the things they were thinking and doing because it gives us an opportunity to get in their heads. On today's show, we are going to talk about red underwear, one of the greatest victories and greatest defeats in warfare history, and how a commander's conference saved a great flyer from being incinerated. Today's episode, episode 12, is brought to you and sponsored by wallpilot.com. Custom aviation artwork for the walls of your home, office, or hangar. These are printed on vinyl. You can peel them off and stick them to your walls. From four foot, six foot, eight foot, we even did a 30 footer for a guy. And the detail on these things is incredible. And today we will have the airplanes we're talking about available for the very first time. So, grab an adult beverage of your choice. Sit down, strap in. And let's begin the Lessons from the Cockpit show. When it came to warfare at sea, the capital ship was king. Battleships were the main weapon of warfare during this time period. Airplanes had been introduced, but nobody thought that they would be of any value. The only value that naval commanders and senior leadership saw for airplanes was long-range reconnaissance taking off and flying for long periods, trying to find the enemy battle groups. But a world war proved them all absolutely wrong. And our hero for the day was an expert, almost like a top gun expert at naval warfare, particularly one aspect of tactics, techniques, and procedures. This top gun expert attends his country's naval academy, but he's not interested in flying. He only becomes interested in learning how to fly after attending the Naval Academy. While he's at the Academy, he meets one of his lifelong friends. And the adversaries of this particular nation actually name tactics, techniques, and procedures after his good friend. And those tactics, techniques, and procedures are still used today by the navies of the world. One of the great characteristics about our hero today is he's a writer. He writes everything down. Even in combat, he was taking notes while flying over enemy targets. And as part of those notes, he makes detailed maps. And on that map, he shows exactly where every weapon touched ground. When you're about to enter a big fight, commanders go out and look for their best shooters. You want to find the people that have the brightest minds and the best expertise to help you in your planning cycle. And this gentleman was no different. He had a lot of wartime experience already when he was tasked to come to the headquarters and begin looking over a plan. Very bold, very audacious plan. But his country was in trouble. Clausewitz says there's two reasons to go to war. Hostile feelings and hostile intent. And this country's feeling both of them right now because they're feeling the pinch of economics. And they're trying to spread themselves out so that they've got all of the things that they need in order to prosecute this war. They all recognize him as the expert. And they all recognize that he has the charisma and the expertise and the experience to lead this raid. The raid is on Pearl Harbor, and this Navy commander is Mitsuo Fuchida. Fuchida and his senior leadership realized that in order for them to attack ships in the shallows of Pearl Harbor, that they needed to keep their torpedoes from going deep into the water, possibly into the mud 
Pearl Harbor is only about 60 to 50 feet deep. They came up with a pretty original way to do this. They put a wooden fins that kind of, when they hit the water, would come off and it would keep the torpedo from uh, going down deeper. And it worked perfectly during the raid. Once they had all the planning complete and the exercises to practice, the carrier task group of six aircraft carriers, Akagi, Kaga, Hiryu, Soryu, Shuikaku, Shokaku, left the Kuril Isles, headed to Pearl Harbor. The night before the raid, Fuchida decided to stay and bunk in with a member of the Kate Squadron on Akagi. He was going to lead the torpedo attack. Can you imagine what those men must have been thinking through the night? <laughs> Sitting there. I, I remember my first combat mission. I was nervous. I was scared. I'm sure there was a lot of things that uh, were going through their minds. They'd been fighting in China for a, quite a while, so maybe not so nervous, but worried more about, you know, will they be found out? Will this be a secret? Will they uh, surprise the enemy? Fuchida made a decision in the morning when he was getting ready for the raid. In case he was captured, he didn't want anybody to know if he was bleeding. <laughs> and so he put on red underwear, red shirt, red drawers under his flight suit. He wanted to make sure if anything happened to him, nobody would know that he was bleeding because the red underwear would uh, disguise any blood. The strike force gets to their launch point and the weather is terrible. They've got 3,500 foot overcast and heavy rain clouds, heavy winds. He even writes in his journal that you could hear the waves slapping up against the side of the aircraft carrier. They're being tossed around pretty good. And there's actually a good movie that looks back from the fantail toward, I think it's Akagi, and you can see it bobbing up and down pretty good in that video. So the leadership has to figure out, are we gonna launch today? Or are we gonna go a little closer to Hawaii? What are we gonna do? And they decide to go ahead and launch in uh, this bad weather. They're able to launch all of the airplanes fairly quickly and climbing out the Zeros, the Vals, the Kates are going through some pretty soupy weather. But once they get on top, everything is fine. And they start heading toward Honolulu. Now they had one of the best navigation aids you could possibly have at this time period in combat. Dialing through the radio frequencies, they picked up a Honolulu radio station that was playing music. And of course, all of their direction finding gear inside the airplane pointed right to it. Pointed right to Honolulu. Nobody in Hawaii knew they were coming, so they're listening to Hawaiian music during their route of flight to the target area. And something happened during this radio uh, broadcast that made them all smile, particularly Fuchita. They gave a weather report for Honolulu. They said there was uh, low clouds over the mountains, but it was partly cloudy throughout everywhere else. And winds were out of the north at 10 knots. Great, great weather report when you're going into combat. <laughs> Have your enemy tell you what the weather is over your target area. The Japanese strike force decided to use Tokyo time for their timing. And at 0241, they broke out of some clouds. And uh, this one point on the northern end of Oahu showed up right underneath them. Dead nuts on, right on time. And Fuchida made the decision to go ahead and attack seven minutes early, but he confused everybody. He used a blue flare to tell everybody, okay, break up into your positions. And he shot it twice and it kind of confused everybody because one guy talked about how he saw the second flare 
He's going, okay, uh, what should we do here? And he decided, okay, we're just going to keep going. And they did. And by 755, Master Arm on, they're uh, queuing up all their weapons. There was a radar station that saw them all coming, knew that they were coming at uh, 7.02 in the morning. The folks at the radar station were all confused. They didn't know what it was. They thought, oh, it's B-17s coming in from the States. Didn't do anything about it. And since it's Sunday morning, they left. 353 planes all coming at Oahu. They decided not to say or do anything about it. And the destroyer ward is already dropping depth charge on uh, one of these midget submarines. So they had indications that the Japanese were coming, but nobody paid any mind to them. Now, Fuchida was disappointed, obviously, that the carriers were not in port. And so they had to go to secondary targets. Doctrinally, the battleships are now become the main targets now that the carriers aren't there. And that's exactly what they go for. The Zeros have attacked the airfields. They destroy almost 160 planes on the ground because they're parked in neat rows, which is exactly how Minoru Genda, Fuchida's college buddy, said they should do it, establish air superiority over the target area, and then go in and wipe it out. And it was called Gendaism for a long time. Mitsuo Fuchida is flying in one of the airplanes that is part of the high-level bombers. He is an expert at high-level bombing and is flying with an 800-kilogram Japanese bomb strapped underneath the airplane. They come across Battleship Row and drop their bombs. And then Fuchida and his Kate goes into a holding pattern and is directing traffic for the first wave and subsequently the second wave. One of the things that they did to his airplane is they put a special camera mount outside the middle cockpit for him to put a camera in and hold it. Many of the pictures of the raid on Pearl Harbor comes from Fuchida and his camera mounted just outside his cockpit. And some of these pictures are fantastic. Now, at 810... Fuchida sees a massive explosion on Battleship Row. Five Kate high-altitude level bombers release their weapons, and some of the bombs hit the Vestal, which is moored next to Arizona, but one penetrates and goes deep inside the forward magazine of the USS Arizona. The USS Arizona explodes in this huge conflagration because the bomb goes off in one million pounds of gunpowder in this forward magazine. Literally blows the ship in half. There was a doctor on a nearby hospital ship who had his camera, an 8mm camera with him, and had been taking video for a couple days of ships coming in and out to include the Arizona. And he had a direct look at the USS Arizona, saw the bombs released from these Kates, saw them coming down, and he actually has an incredible video of the Arizona sitting still and then exploding in this huge explosion and this massive fire afterward. The Arizona burned for a couple days after this hit at 8.10 in the morning. The first wave clears off. Now the second wave comes in, and he's still directing traffic over the, over the harbor. And apparently there was one pilot or one crew that wasn't doing what they were supposed to, and he's told his pilot to go up next to him and fly up next to him in formation, and he kind of scolds him over the air, pointing at him and, and shaking his fist and, and kind of hollering at him. He didn't do anything over the radio. When they left the carriers, they actually had put p- pieces of paper so that the radios wouldn't transmit to make sure nobody made any uh, extraneous transmissions. Of course, now they've got that piece of paper pulled out. Fuchita sees... 
one of his crews not doing what they're supposed to, and he flies right up next to him and gets after him. Well, finally, by 9.30, everything is done with, and uh, they turn around and head for home. They all land back on the aircraft carriers, and of course, everyone in the headquarters on board the ships and in Tokyo had heard the words, Tora, 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 meaning they were attacking and they had com- complete surprise. And so everybody was anxious to talk to him. A number of the commanders got on the ground and says, we've got to go back. We've got to strike it again. There's still targets we've got to go hit. And we have to remember, Chuichi Nagumo, the vice admiral who is commanding the task force, is a surface warfare guy, not an air warfare guy. And he's very cautious. He hears everybody out, Fuchida, Genda, everybody, but he goes, no, we've lost the surprise. We need to turn around and skedaddle out of here. And because of that, they've missed some, some good targets. Now, in his book, Midway, The Battle That Doomed Japan, Fuchida talks about some of his lessons learned. One of his first lessons is they need better weapons. They had almost a 68% dud rate of their bombs. That's horrible. 68% of their bombs never exploded. And so they had to go back and take a real good look at their fusing and their bombs because a lot of them hit their targets and never went off. Second area of concern and lessons learned. They did not pick their targets well. In the heat of battle, they followed their doctrine and that was battleships are the capital ship and they must be destroyed. But they went after some of these smaller ships too. And in one case, the destroyer Shaw has 15 airplanes dive bomb it and completely blow it up. There's a an incredible picture of this fireball of the USS Shaw blowing up. The USS Pennsylvania a battleship is in dry dock and there's two destroyers in front of it. And the USS Casson gets hit by multiple bombs and is completely destroyed. And there's also another really famous picture of the Cassons and wood and everything just floating and it's leaning up against the destroyer that was next to it. So they didn't pick their targets well. They never went after the fuel farms, which was completely out in the open. They could have destroyed the fuel farms and there would have not been any gas in the Pacific for a long time. But during the war, there was one type of naval warfare that really, really crippled the Japanese. And that was submarine warfare. And none of the submarine pens at Pearl Harbor were touched during the entire raid. Admiral Lockwood, who was in charge of the submarine force in the Pacific, sent out the famous message saying, unrestricted submarine warfare against the Japanese. And it was devastating to them. And during the Pearl Harbor raid, none of the sub pens were even touched. Everybody was going after the ships because that was the doctrine of the time. I think the third lesson learned concerns the carriers. They were south of Oahu doing exercises. Nagumo had everything he needed to launch a second wave and go out and look for the carriers but he didn't. And those two carriers became very important later on. He had six aircraft carriers to two. He had the airplanes he needed, the weapons that he needed. He probably could have gone and found them and put those things at the bottom of the ocean, but he chose not to. He was very cautious. And again, he's not an air guy. He's not an aviator. Nagumo is a surface warfare guy. And he follows surface warfare doctrine to the T. I think there's one last thing I want to say about the Pearl Harbor raid, and that is the courage of the Americans. Fuchida got back uh, aboard the carrier and said that the anti-aircraft fire was intense. 
They lost, I think it was 29 airplanes in this raid. That was kind of a lot. And there's one picture that is looking down on Pearl Harbor and you can see all the anti-aircraft puffs up in the air. The Americans put up a really deadly barrage of anti-aircraft fire and were able to shoot down a number of planes. While doing my research, I found something really interesting that I'm that I've linked to down below. The debrief of the attack on Pearl Harbor was on the Akagi. Mitsuo Fuchida is telling the commanders exactly what happened, the senior leadership, Nagumo, and so forth. He made a very detailed map of Pearl Harbor. See, he was an artist and a, a record keeper. <laughs> and that map is still in existence. A collector bought it for $425,000 and it's now in the Library of Congress. You can go and look at it, and, and you can find it online, but I've put a link below to the map that Fuchita made of the attack. Now, he shows the Arizona, he's got flames coming out of it. He shows uh, red marks going into the different uh, ships on, on uh, Battleship Bro, counting the number of torpedo hits they've got, everything. It, it is really something to see. Go and take a look at the link that I've provided below so you can see this $425,000 map now in the Library of Congress made by Mitsuo Fuchida after the raid during the debrief. Yamamoto said, we'll run wild for six months. And then after that point, he wasn't sure what was going to happen. Remember, Isoroku Yamamoto had lived in the United States, gone to school at Harvard, and he understood the American culture and what we could do. Fuchida leads airstrikes in Australia, the British Empire, Ceylon. They sink more ships, more aircraft carriers. They're running wild. Then they get to Coral Sea, and the Shokaku and Zuikaku are badly damaged. Now they begin planning another big campaign. And this one is as close to Hawaii as they could possibly get. But this proves very disastrous for the Imperial Japanese Navy. They make their plan so complex that it's hard to execute. Complexity is the enemy of operational planning, and particularly execution. Part of the force goes up to the Aleutians kind of as a diversionary force. Four of the carriers are going to come to a little island that they keep calling in all of their messages AF. Now, this is where our intelligence begins to really shine. And many of you have probably watched the recent movie on Midway and saw Commander Layton and his group do some just incredible work. See, the thing about signals intelligence and electronic intelligence is you find out your enemy's intentions. And they sent out that little message that says, AF's water separator isn't working, something about their water system. And of course, it goes through the Japanese loop and comes back, AF is having problem with their water system. And now they know, Nimitz knows, everybody knows, the Japanese next battle is going to be fought at Midway Island. It's during this time that Mitsuo Fushida gets sick. He's Denif, what we call duty not including flying because he has an appendicitis at sea and has to be worked on to fix that. And during the airstrikes, he can't fly off of the Akagi. But a bunch of things are going wrong and the Japanese don't know it. And in his book, the battle that doomed Japan, Fuchida talks about this. One thing he says is we had victory, victory disease. We thought we were invincible. We didn't think anybody could beat us. And that put a barrier in their minds because they didn't think that the Americans not only didn't know they were coming, but they didn't know that they had broken the Japanese code. And so Nimitz set a big trap for them and they walked right into it. Fuchida, because he can't fly, part of the planning and the execution, and he is on the bridge at that fateful four minutes. On June 4th, between 1022 and 1026, the Enterprise and Hornet uh, strike packages happen to come upon the four carriers all at the same time. They come diving in, just like you see in the movie, and three of the carriers are burning. 
One of them being Akagi, which Mitsuo Fuchida is standing on the bridge. Nagumo had about 15 minutes to make a decision on should he go bomb Midway Island or should he go after Task Force 17, Task Force 16 that were within range of the Japanese aircraft. And he makes that fateful decision to go from bombing Midway to going after the aircraft carriers. In an absolute miracle, Max Leslie, Dick Best, and Wade McCluskey all show up at the same time overhead the carriers. Akagi gets hit. Airplanes are fully fueled. And in fact, the engines are running and the airplanes are within five to six minutes of taking off when bombs start uh, impacting the aircraft carrier. Because they're fully fueled, fully armed, below decks and above decks on the Akagi, there is this chain of explosions that happens, basically destroys the ship. They're trying to get off of the bridge when a bomb or a torpedo goes off on one of the airplanes just below the bridge. Now there's flames coming up that side of the bridge and they can't get off. They start shimmying down a rope from the bridge down to the deck. And as Fuchida gets about halfway down, another bomb goes off, cooks off on the deck, and he falls about 20 to 15 feet on both of his ankles. And he breaks both of his ankles and now is immobile himself. A number of his people grab him and take him someplace safe and he is eventually moved to another ship and is sent home. The Battle of Midway was the turning point for the war in the Pacific. But the Japanese are trying hard not to let the people back home on mainland Japan know they have been defeated and it is a big one. So big that four of the carriers of the six that attacked Pearl Harbor are now gone. The two that are surviving are still pretty beat up. They don't have a carrier force left in the Pacific. The Japanese must face the industrial might of the United States. And when you look at how quickly the industrial capacity of the United States builds up during the war, it's amazing. Essex-class carriers are being completed like in a year. Uh, I heard somewhere that troop ships were being literally completed in as little as two weeks. The, the basic form of it being completely done in two weeks and then the finishing off maybe another couple of weeks. The Japanese could never take on the industrial might of the United States. We're producing aircraft carriers, battleships, all kinds of things, and destroying the Japanese capability to wage war in the Pacific. Mitsuo Fuchida goes back to Japan. He has to have a couple of surgeries to fix his ankles, and he begins teaching in their flight schools because, again, he's one of these incredible experts. As the war continues on, he is moving around Japan. He's involved in a lot of meetings. He's involved in a lot of planning, but it takes him a while to get literally back on his feet, no pun intended. He says on the Merv Griffin show in 1964, when he's being interviewed by Merv, that he knew at the end of the Battle of Guadalcanal, there was no way for the Japanese to win. He's going through the war knowing that the Americans are getting stronger and stronger and stronger while they're getting weaker. They have this big, huge commander's conference in Tokyo, and he leaves on August 5th from Hiroshima to go to this commander's conference. The day before Paul Tibbets drops the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. He's in Tokyo the next day, hears the news of this incredible bomb that the Americans have dropped and it's completely wiped out Hiroshima. And on the 7th, he goes back to Hiroshima. And he leads the team of Japanese who are doing the research on the effects of this new type of bomb that has leveled Hiroshima. 
incinerated tens of thousands of people. Within just a few weeks of this team being back in Hiroshima doing their research, a couple of them start getting sick and sicker and sicker and die. And out of a team, I think of 15 to 20 Japanese researchers, all of them die except for Mitsuo Fujita. He's the only one that survives off of this team that is trying to find out what happened. The war ends. He and Genda are both survivors. And one day, Mitsuo Fujita is walking in Tokyo and he sees a group of people on a street corner. He doesn't know what the, quite what they're doing. He notices they're Americans, though. And this is about, two, I think, two years after the war. And as he walks by, someone puts a, like, tracked or folded message in front of him. And he goes back and he reads through this thing. And it is a Christian church tract, a religious tract. And he's kind of wondering, well, what is all this about? And he begins reading the Bible. But he comes in contact with a very interesting person. Mitsuo Fuchida becomes really good friends with Jacob DeShazer. Jacob DeShazer had been a prisoner of war in Japan because he was one of the crew members flying a B-25 in the Doolittle Raid. And he finds out from his friends that are coming back from being prisoners of war that they were treated very well. And a matter of fact, he meets one of his radio operators that he thought was dead. And he tells him, we were treated very well. And there was a lady, I think her name was last name was Colville, Ann Colville, I think was her name, was taking care of the Japanese prisoners of war, some of them here in the state of Utah. But he finds out from Jacob DeShazer how terribly the Japanese were treating the American prisoners of war. Now, I admit, there was atrocities on both sides. That's not debatable. But it kind of turns his heart a little bit. And he reads his Bible and he hears about how well the Americans treated the prisoners of war. He converts, becomes a Christian. And he and Jacob DeShazer of the Doolittle Raid become very good friends. I have put a couple links in the description of this episode so that you can go and see some of this. The Merv Griffin Show, the episode that Mitsuo Fuchida was on, is available on YouTube. I went and watched it. He's got an interpreter there with him. Mitsuo Fuchida speaks English not very well, and is able to answer a lot of the questions. It's really interesting when Merv Griffin introduces him and tells his audience who he is. And you just hear this quiet go over the entire crowd. There is also some really good documentaries that I've linked to on the Pearl Harbor Raid. It's a three-part documentary. And also on the Midway Raid, which is also three parts. And then a really good website that I found that talks about his life. I recommend all of you go and get Mitsuo Fuchida's book, Midway, The Battle That Doomed Japan. It really allows you to get inside the Japanese psyche during those six to eight months where they were winning battle after battle after battle until they came to Midway. And the last chapter is Mitsuo Fuchida's like Lessons Learned where he talks about, we had victory disease. We thought we were invincible. We never thought you guys would break our code. A year later, they have broken the entire code. The Japanese don't change it. Isoroku Yamamoto sends out very detailed messages and he puts his whole route of flight down to an island called Bougainville where he's going to go down and, and review the troops. And Yamamoto is killed in a Betty bomber when they're intercepted by P-38s. And he's shot down. And that Betty bomber is still in the jungle. And through the entire rest of the war, the Americans are reading all of their cryptic messages. We're doing the same thing in Europe with the Germans. 
we got an Enigma machine off of a submarine and we were able to read all of their messages. The Japanese program was called Magic and we're reading all of their messages too. And they never thought to change it. They never thought that the Americans would break their code. The Japanese ran into the full might of industrial America, being able to build airplanes and ships and aircraft carriers and tanks and so forth that they could not take on. And I don't think they realized how massive that industrial effort was going to be. And Fuchida also talks about, we made these elaborate plans. One of his lessons learned is complexity is the death of execution. Sometimes in our lives, we come up with these elaborate things that we're going to do and we do all of this planning and we have plan A and plan B and plan C and that complexity can really hamper execution. The other thing that they didn't do was they didn't bring all six of their aircraft carriers together. They had some going up to the Aleutians and he realizes they should have concentrated their force. One of the principles of war is mass and economy of force. Behind the aircraft carriers was Yamamoto and the battleships and, of course, the landing force, too. And if they'd have brought that full weight of that power against not only Task Force 17, Task Force 16, and Midway Island, this could have been very different. They could have pounded the island of Midway with those big battleships and all of these other ships and they didn't concentrate their force. Main body of that force was like 700 miles away, 300 miles away from the carriers. And you could have put them all together and that would have been a very, very formidable, formidable task force. Now we knew they were coming and we prepared, but still they had the opportunity to win that battle. Mitsuo Fuchida is fortunate that he got called away to a commander's conference and was not there when the bomb was dropped. And it's amazing that he survived the radiation sickness that the rest of his team succumbed to. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Lessons from the Cockpit and learning about Captain Mitsuo Fuchida. Later on in life, he went on to do other great things, but mostly he was a missionary and traveled all over the world with Jacob DeShazer and his wife uh, teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Special thanks once again to Wall Pilot, custom aviation artwork for the walls of your home, office, or hangar, for being the sponsor of this episode of Lessons from the Cockpit. In the lesson notes, I have put a link to Wall Pilot and Mitsuo Fuchida's Nakajima B5N2 Kate that he was flying in during the Pearl Harbor raid which is available at Wall Pilot in four, six, and eight foot lengths. On next week's show, I'm gonna share with you my reading list. Midway, The Battle That Doomed Japan is one of those great books on my reading list, but many people have asked me, hey, what have you read? What books have you read and what books are on your reading list? And next week, I'm gonna share with you my top 25 books that I think every historian, tactician should have on their shelf. And I look forward to doing this. I've spoken at a number of ROTC units and military groups and so forth, and they've always asked me that one question. Hey, what books have you been reading and what books should I have on my bookshelf? And uh, next week, I'm going to answer that question. Folks, if you want to listen to more episodes of Lessons from the Cockpit, you can go to my website, marcusera.com, and just go to the podcast pull-down page, and all 12 episodes and all the show notes are right there. been great to be with you today. Look forward to talking to you next week.